Whether focusing on indefinite detention and military spending, or fighting for closures and financial abuse, protesters from the Occupy movement have redirected the political dialogue in the U.S. and around the globe. Campaigns and actions continued today despite a crackdown from police and city officials on the encampments that first drew nationwide attention. In Noam Chomsky's new book *Occupy: From Sukkoti Park Press*, the renowned historian, linguist, and activist uses his decades of experience to analyze the social movement. The book examines what gave rise to its direct action last year, and what could come ahead as a mass movement takes aim at social and economic inequality and political power. For more, Noam Chomsky joins us now from Boston. Welcome to FSRN. Glad to be with you. You call Occupy unprecedented. There is, of course, a long list of social protests and actions in U.S. history. They include the abolition of slavery, securing voting rights, the fight for labor protections. What makes Occupy different? Well, first, the, all of those movements are very significant ones. They lasted over many years. Uh, some victories, many defeats. Uh, Uh, finally achieved things. In the case of uh, abolition of slavery, for example, it took a civil war. A uh, struggle for labor rights has been going on for a century and a half, and is still going on. Uh, the Occupy movement came basically out of nowhere. Nobody could have predicted it. I certainly couldn't if I'd been asked last a year ago. Does it make any sense to try this? I would have said it could never get anywhere. But it was a uh, A major uh, uh, react, a, a spark took off, and it uh, is the first uh, significant organized activist response to an assault on the population uh, that's been going on for over 30 years, uh, and uh, pl plenty of discontent, plenty of anger, lots of small, you know, some efforts to uh, plan for a long-term future, some uh, efforts to deal with immediate problems, but uh, this one was quite unprecedented. And, the, uh, uh, and it makes sense because the, uh, uh, what it's reacting to is also unprecedented. I mean, what's happened in the United States for the past roughly 35 years is a pretty sharp departure from uh, the entire course of American history. Well, you go back and trace the major changes during those past 30 years. One aspect you focus on is the changing role of banks in the U.S., that before the 1970s, they served the purpose set up in a capitalist system to take money from one person or entity that is not being used and to loan it or invest it in another place, and that this contributed to a certain degree of economic growth. What changed in the 1970s for banks, and why is that important to the situation of inequality we have today? Well, two major things happened in the 1970s. Uh, they were interconnected. Uh, one of them is that the International. There, there had been an international system established by the United States and Britain after the Second World War, the Bretton Woods system, uh, for uh, uh, controlling international economic arrangements. Uh, had many aspects. One of them was uh, a pretty narrow controls on uh, capital. Uh, on, on capital, that meant there was very little speculation. Uh, financial capital was overwhelmingly used in the ways you described, uh, which within a state capitalist society can be constructive. Uh, th that all was broken down in the 70s, uh, the international and the domestic aspects. There was a huge increase, spectacular increase, in the uh, uh, short-term flow of speculative capital, and uh, with it the a uh, very sh significant, very sharp growth in the uh, scale and power of financial institutions, uh, which were not performing uh, the role that a bank is supposed to perform in a state capitalist society, but were, in, were uh, uh, attacking currencies, uh, making uh, short-term speculations, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the risky transactions developing, began to develop complex instruments, uh, complex financial instruments. 
uh, uh, all of this contributed to a, an increasing concentration of wealth in a narrow sector, increasingly the financial sector. A concentration of wealth leads to concentration of political power almost reflexively, and that leads right away to uh, uh, legislation uh, to increase, to uh, keep the vicious cycle uh, going uh, upwards. So, for example, the deregulation mania went along with uh, kind of a fanatic ideology of uh, all th through large parts of the economic profession, extended to others, influenced the Fed, Federal Reserve, of uh, you know kind of a belief in uh, an almost fanatic religious belief in the uh, efficiency of markets, efficient market hypothesis, uh, rational expectations, and so on. Uh, no empirical basis for it, uh, and it was built on sand, and it's uh, regularly refuted, and in fact, right now, it's almost totally cr crashed in a manner that uh, uh, no intellectual evidence, edifice and intellectual history ever has, I think, but it's reconstituted right away because it fits quite well with the needs of and uh, interests of those who pretty much run the economy and hence pretty much own the society and direct it. We're speaking with author Noam Chomsky. His new book, Occupy, out from Zuccotti Park Press, explores the history that led to the social movement and what could lie ahead. Noam Chomsky, we've covered some of the issues that Occupy has focused on. What about strategy and how many of the Occupy encampments operated with general assemblies, uh, working groups, building an effort to build consensus. You've spoken about the power of a manufacturing facility or a business that is operated by the stakeholders instead of the shareholders. How about protest movements? Is this showing a different style of governance that can be used? Oh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's an aspect of the same style of governance. I mean, the uh, communities of the kind that formed in Zuccotti Square and innumerable other places, actually thousands in this country and many abroad, are a kind of a microcosm for uh, the kind of organization of uh, 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 productive and other activities that are illustrated by the examples you mentioned. Uh, Worker-owned, worker-managed. Uh, enterprises, uh, cooperatives, uh, consumer cooperatives, others. Now, these are spreading and they should be integrated. So part of the one aspect of the goals of the Occupy movement, I think, should be to uh, try to reach out and engage and in fact even sometimes initiate uh, efforts of the kind that you mentioned, like uh, stakeholder owned, stakeholder means workforce and community owned, uh, and managed uh, uh, enterprises. And part of the malaise of the society, uh, which incidentally has been pretty well studied by sociologists, is that it's become very highly atomized. Uh, people don't talk to their neighbors in the traditional phrase. Uh, they're alone, tend to be alone, uh, it, engaged and trapped in uh, often quite mindless consumerism by by design, uh, and uh, have, have the bonds of association and uh, interaction, which are the basis of any healthy, functioning, certainly democratic society, uh, these have been pretty much shattered. And uh, the Occupy movement was beginning to create them. Uh, well, if those bonds and associations uh, can not only survive, but expand to bring in a larger part of the society, now that could be extremely significant in itself, uh, quite apart from the quite significant goals that are uh, uh, being articulated and uh, are the basis for many different kinds of action. So we're at a point now where it seems that many of the Occupy locations have moved from physical encampments to other forms of protest and action. You've charted this concentration of political and economic power over the past decades. How do you see the Occupy movement addressing this moving forward? Well, the Occupy movement was uh, 
has been the first organized uh, activist uh, reaction to this and has the two dimensions I mentioned, both policy-oriented and uh, building uh, uh, communities that can be a kind of a, a model, uh, even a node of development uh, to go beyond. Uh, where it'll go after a few months, uh, well, you know, who can say? You can never predict the course of a popular movement. But it was unprecedented. Professor Noam Chomsky, I want to ask about Occupy and U.S. foreign policy. You go back and assess the mass mobilizing that took place in multiple cities before the invasion of Iraq, and before that, of course, against the war in Vietnam. How about today, where there is U.S. military action on multiple fronts in Afghanistan? Obama recently signed a deal with President Karzai that will continue U.S. military presence for years to come. Iraq is still facing regular violence and extreme political instability. Um, There's also the expanding role of drone attacks in Pakistan Yemen and elsewhere, how can the energy or logistical organization of Occupy strengthen anti-war efforts? Uh, We're now getting into a new and very interesting and large topic, but unfortunately time has run out. Uh, Occupy hasn't really oriented itself much towards international affairs, though it definitely should. Uh, Everything that you mentioned is significant. Uh, There's a potential a war with Iran that could, in fact, we already are at war with Iran. Uh, that's uh, the s- severity of the blockade uh, amounts to a economic warfare, serious war. Uh, and it could go on to a, you know, to, to a, to a war with uh, you know, bom- bombs and missiles, uh, which could be you know, that have uh, horrifying consequences. And there's plenty more. Uh, those are big topics. Incidentally, there's another one that uh, we haven't mentioned yet, which uh, and that's the looming environmental crisis. And if nothing is done about that, it'll do us all in. And the prospects are not promising by any means. Well, I wish I had time to talk about all those things, but another topic. <laughs> Noam Chomsky's new book is called Occupy, out now from Zuccotti Park Press. Noam Chomsky, thank you for joining us on FSRN. Glad to be with you.